Okay, hello everyone, it's Saturday. And let me just make sure we're on the screen here too. Yes, here we go. So, welcome to a very special edition today. We're not going to talk about eagles, we're going to talk about orcas. I announced this already wildly on wildly and widely <laughs> on YouTube and Facebook. And I'm very honored to have with me today a zoologist, a science writer called Henne Streyer. I hope I pronounced it correctly. She's from Denmark, but her main activity is actually in Norway, where there's a where she was a co-founder of a whale institute. It's very interesting. Uh, so we're going to talk about orcas. I'm going to get our special friend David Hancock, uh, who's of course an eagle biologist, but also has dealt with orcas in the past. So I think it's going to be a rather interesting, uh, interesting hour that we're going to have together. Don't hesitate to put in questions. So we're live at the moment on YouTube, Facebook, and also Periscope. So let me first um, introduce uh, Hannah Streyer to you. One second, let me just get her in and a title. There you are. Hi, Hannah from, from Denmark, I believe, at the moment. Yes. yes, hello. It's very nice to be here. Well, it's a great pleasure. I mean, I got to know you actually, actually through Instagram. I posted a lot on Instagram until I saw Hannah's incredible pictures about uh, orcas. And uh, it's going to be a pleasure to walk you through this. And um, I will also show you Hannah's page. And also, um, you know, she's author of, of a book on the modest, uh, on Charles Darwin, The Modest Genius. And we'll talk a bit about that too. So lots of things to look forward to. So um, anyway, Hannah, welcome. I'm just going to organize the screen. So give me a second. Uh, let me see if I can get everyone in here. One second. Get. David in and get you in. Okay, so welcome, David, too. Welcome again. <laughs> Pleased to be here. I was had a wonderful few minutes with, with Hannah, and uh, obviously we have a past that's kind of evolved uh, from similar roots. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be very interesting. So what I thought, uh, just that all the viewers here know how we want to proceed, is I'm going to uh, we're going to ask a bit about uh, Hannah's background and so on. I'll get David to to then ask Hannah some specific questions because of his background, and then uh, I will start collecting all the questions. So don't hesitate to ask lots of questions. I'll be collecting them as we go. So I hope this is going to be interesting for all of you. So let's go ahead. Henna, can you please tell us a little bit about your, your background, how you got into orcas and so on? Thank you. Well, that was a coincidence, actually. I know that a lot of people who study whales, they say that that's what they wanted to do their whole life. But for me, it wasn't really like that. I wanted to be a biologist because I, I really, I was interested in everything about nature and wildlife. And, uh, and one day I was in the university cantina and I was behind this very tall guy and I, I had seen him before. It's a big university with thousands and thousands of students, but I've seen him before because he was like two meters tall, so he was hard to miss. And we started talking and, um, and I asked, because he had given a lecture on, on this expedition he was going on was a public lecture and I came along with a lot of other people and I asked how it was going with the expedition and then he said well actually he was leaving next week and they were they didn't have a, a, a cook to uh, to be on the boat and uh, if I could cook I could come along and a week later I was on the boat and I was cooking I didn't have a lot of experience in cooking or being in the boat but um, but I, that's that's how the whole thing started and i never i never turned i never looked back that's it just uh, became my destiny so that's that's amazing i mean that's an amazing initiative it, it, it just shows how you open doors so how did you transition from a cook to become a zoologist <laughs> uh, i was already studying biology so it was uh, I, I i mean everybody on the boat were either biologists or photographers mm. so the talk over the dinner table was always about whales and biology and ecology and marine biology so there was, uh, i was learning a lot just from being with other very interesting people uh, so in a way that was just as interesting and 
expanding uh, of my mind as taking several university courses. And, and then later I co-founded this whale center together with some of the people on the boat uh, in northern Norway uh, and stayed there and worked there as a guide. And after a few years, I went back to university, found a supervisor and told him I want to study killer whales. And he uh, he kind of rolled his eyes and 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 you know his attitude to somebody like me was that especially women that it was uh, you know it was a bit like horse riding girls that and he <laughs> very openly that yeah you know girls they want to study whales just like they want to ride horses and and he was very derogative. And patronizing, but I insisted, and uh, and just shook it off, and uh, made a study of killer whales communication in Norway. Well, that's incredible, David. Do you want to ask some questions? Go ahead. So. <laughs> well, no, that that's rather interesting. I didn't know her beginning um, because I'm sitting here on the west coast, and I know she spent quite a bit of time here. So, when did you first get out? here to the west coast of, of British Columbia, the Seattle area? Well, that took a few years. I, I, got, a, um, uh, I got a grant, a, a, a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship to study in the States. And while I was there, I met up with people in Canada with uh, John Ford and um, uh, Lance, Barrett Leonard, and, and people like that who are already studying killer whales. And I was really inspired by, especially John's study on on dialects in killer whale groups, and wanted to see if that was just something that they did in Canada, or if that was also typical of killer whales in Norway. So I, I, I pretty much studied killer whale dialects in Norway, and had very good help from John Ford. Um, so you probably knew Paul and Helen of Spong as well out at the Orca Labs. I've only just met them very briefly. Uh, I don't know them very well, but um, I, I think that was more a coincidence depending on when I was there. Or, but I know, of course, of them. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe let's dive right into, you know, in, in, into some very current topics, because I heard uh, David and uh, Hannah talk before. It is, uh, you know, topics like um, how are orcas different between, you know, between different uh, parts of, of, of the world? How, how does their behavior change? And then, of course, how are they related to the fishing industry and many other things that worry us quite now? So let's jump right in now. Well, Norwegian killer whales are different from Canadian uh, Pacific Northwest killer whales in uh, in several ways. They obviously they look like them. They are big and black and white uh, whales, just like killer whales all over the world. And I don't think I could tell the difference if I saw one them next to each other. But they are mainly herring specialists. Uh, so they they feed on schooling fish, and that's a very specialized behavior. Uh, it's, I've seen killer whales in other places who hunt salmon that I know that they do also in the Pacific Northwest. And salmon hunting is an individual chase. Uh, one whale follows the salmon and catches it and eats it. Whereas uh, herring is so much smaller, and the schools are sometimes so huge that it's unbelievable, um, and killers actually can't catch an individual herring. They are simply too fast, so that they have to corral them into a, a tight ball of herring that they swim around in a circle. They emit bubbles a little bit like we know humpback whales do, and then when they uh, bubble net and they turn the white underside uh, towards the herring. The herring is panicking and the ball is getting tighter and tighter. And once it's very tight and close to the surface, the killer whales take turns swimming into the herring ball and slapping them very violently 
with their tail. And when they do that, 10, 15 herring flies to the side and they are they're simply stunned by the pressure from the tail slack, probably because of the, the cat in their swim bladder. And they become, some of them die directly and some of them are just disoriented and lying on the surface. Um, and the killer whales can then grab them one by one and eat them. So that's a very special uh, technique that they use uh, that you find in um, in the Norwegian killer whales and also in the killer whales that are around Iceland. There are a few observations of killer whales also feeding on marine mammals and the woman who is studying those killer whales are uh, convinced that it's one special group who is doing that uh, so you could call them transients but it's not very common it's not something that we see very often and i've actually never seen it in norwegian killer whales Oops, we've got sometimes a sound coming in i don't know where that's coming from if you hear it but it's okay but uh, that's very interesting tell us also about the you know you co-founded co an institute that is uh, north of the Arctic Circle, which is quite interesting. Can you talk us, uh, t tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the, 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 this boat that I ended up on cooking, there was the people who were there were interested in, in establishing whale watching in Norway. This was at a time where whaling was uh, very controversial in, Nor in, in Norway. Uh, I don't know if you know that the International Whaling Commission, they enforced a moratorium on whaling in 82, that was starting in 86. And the Norwegians uh, filed uh, an, ex an exception to it, mm -hmm. which meant that they could legally continue to hunt whales. And uh, some of us felt that it was a good idea to offer an alternative to whaling, to have uh, people go out and look at whales instead. And uh, the whale watching was started in northern Norway. And with that, the whole whale center in Andenes, uh, in northern Norway, was started at the same time. It attracted a lot of students who were studying uh, different species of whales. And there was even a small museum. So it was the museum, the students studying whales, and the tourism together was this whale center, which still exists, uh, but in a different form today. Right, right, right. Uh, David, maybe you want to um, talk a bit about your background and also, you know, your um, uh, what is related to, to, to orcas and maybe just also relate a bit to the different experience we have here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I, I was interested and surprised that things seem to have been a little bit later, Hannah, in, in Norway. I um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, and years are not my best thing at remembering, but I think we abandoned all whale hunting in 1967, because I think that was the year I went out and, and did a film on, on the very last, the second to last boat to leave the harbor at Coal Harbor up on Vancouver Island. And, uh, I got to go on it and film the last whaling. I wasn't sure I could handle it uh, emotionally, but I decided historically I wanted to see it. And so I, I went aboard it. And um, I think that was when we actually quit whaling. It was back in about 67. So I'm surprised that, but I do know, I mean, I have been listening to Paul Spong and, and his annual statement that's almost since then um, uh, about how he reports on the International Whaling Commission. Maybe it's not quite that long, but following how Norway has, if you'll pardon me, has been the bad guy <laughs> and along with Japan. Um, um, in, in well, terms of I, I, I don't know the details of this, but my feeling is uh, that the Norwegian whaling continues only for one species, for the minke whale, which is the small baleen whale. And uh, they allow quotas for around a thousand individuals per year. 
And what I can see from cat statistics is that they are they are not fishing or hunting their quota. Um, and my guess is that whaling is simply dying out. Um, there's not so much the demand for it anymore, and it's not a profession that attracts young men. So I, my guess is that in another 10, 15 years, it's not going to be there, not because they decided to stop or because of international anything, but simply because it's dying out. Well, you know, just related to that, I'm going to bring in the first question here. Tiger Lily actually says, so why do people want to hunt whales? And related to that, of course, is what is changing in this. Well, uh, well, I'm not a Norwegian, so I can't say for <laughs> okay. sure about everything. But, but what I understand from having lived there and talked to people is that a lot of the resistance to to you know giving in to the moratorium was was something of national pride you know we don't want them to come and tell us what to do this is our country and this is and and so on and so forth and so that was one reason another reason was that for a lot of people especially in northern norway they felt that this was uh, a strong tradition and it was part of their culture not a culture like deeply rooted in an ancestral way of living in First Nation people, but something that their grandfather did and their dad did, and, and they always had whale meat for Sunday dinners. So it was something that they felt pretty strongly was, this is part of what we do up here in North. Uh, so for many people, that was the reason why they continued. Um, and also, it was, for a lot of people, the whole question of sustainability was very important. Uh, that they, you can, I think you can find a lot of Norwegians who would say that it's more sustainable to eat an animal that is healthy, lived a good life, um, the population is not threatened, the species is not threatened, you're not farming it, you're not supporting great big industrial farms. So you can very quickly get involved in a discussion with some Norwegians whether is it better to eat industrially farmed pork or beef or chicken than meat from an animal that lived in the sea. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to go there into that big discussion. I'm just citing what comes up when you talk to people. But I can tell that in the more than 30 years that I've been coming in, in Norway and living in Norway and working in Norway, that it's becoming more and more rare to see whale meat. So I, it's my feeling that it's simply dying out. And David, do you want to add anything to that from our perspective here? Well, what's most fascinating is what um, Hannah and I were discussing just before we came on the air. She's working on a book which I know would be at the, my heart as well. And it's about the changing philosophical approaches of the human race to, to this kind of thing. And in her case, she's focusing, I understand, on, on whales. But um, it's, it's this relationship that people have had with the predators around the world that's always fascinated me and that's what sort of got me involved in this to start with because it, as you know at 11 i became a falconer and i got involved in training hawks for hunting and then uh, very quickly i started to acquire uh, hawks from the fish and wildlife branch then i would get uh, seals and and sea lions brought in and seabirds to to um rehabilitate them and, and so I got quite involved in in a whole list of different predators and, and kind of caring for them and so you end up uh, that those very early experiences in the early 50s um, kind of directed how my my life unfolded so this philosophical change of how people look at to predators I, I find quite fascinating and and uh, uh, a lot of my uh, life and my talks are, are, are on the same situation. I, I, we started to 
talk about different experiences and I wouldn't tell her the story that I'm going to tell you now because it it was a it was a kind of definitive one. Um, as you know, uh, Christian, I I went and became a commercial pilot before I went and decided to go to university and went through undergrad and then grad school. When I finally got to grad school, one of the first expeditions, the scientific expeditions that I got invited to go and deal with, partly because I was going, I was on my thesis on eagles but it was because I had also been to a great many of the remote islands on the British Columbia coast and, and had been involved in seabird research. And so I was invited to go and spend a month with my wife on Triangle Island. That's a, a, an ecological reserve today, but in those days it was just a, a rock out in the Pacific that had about 7 million seabirds and huge colonies of seals and sea lions and mm -hmm. even ground nesting eagles and peregrine falcons on. So I'm, I, I'm leaving, w w my wife and I are leaving from Tofino on this, the west coast of Vancouver Island on a federal research vessel, the GB Reed. And mm -hmm. we get about 10 miles out into the humping sea and the big swell. It wasn't a stormy day or anything. It was a calm day, but the swells are out there. And all of a sudden somebody yells, killer whales. And we're, two of about five different scientists on the boat um, were the only two that are going to go to this island. But other people were also working on things like orcas and fish. And one of the guys goes rushing past us as we're looking out the window and he goes down into the hold of the, of the GB Reed and he comes up staggering up carrying a machine gun and he mounts the machine gun on the bow of the research vessel and they just start to unload uh, great big machine gun bullets into the pod of killer whales. Um, that was my first experience of seeing how horrible we treated this animal. I hadn't seen this before and it was government official policy that when you encountered eat, um, orcas that you shot them. Now, I know Hannah has equal stories because she was starting to tell me them and they carried on much later. Um, but when we anchored at the same island and we were getting out into our little boat to go ashore for our month, um, out came the machine gun again, got mounted on the front of the boat because 150 yards off to the east uh, was a little rock that was a stellar sea lion colony. And uh, they were just hauled out and breeding. And they unloaded hundreds and hundreds of rounds of machine gun fire into the, uh, into the stellar sea lion colony, killing um, dozens and dozens of animals and wounding uh, a great many more. And I, I, I guess, what, why I'm telling the story, mm -hmm. it's not just about the horribleness that humans can be, but it's a story that has changed. You could not do that here on the West Coast today. Um, and it's the kind of story that I have had as a kind of a positive response. And that we've changed. We would not tolerate that today. And that's a good sign because uh, it represents this, this sign of hope, at least as I see it, that we, we often measure how terrible the human race is screwing up the environment, how we're overfishing, over harvesting everything, mm -hmm. to spoiling the sea, the forests, or whatever it is. But there are times when we come to grips with this and some of this pure wastefulness um we can change and we did change that mm -hmm. behavior uh, we we wouldn't go out and do that today and and so i'm i'm positively encouraged by this i mean it's the same thing happened with eagles i mean i i love the fact that hannah has an eagle behind her. I don't. Here I'm the eagle pilot. She's got an eagle behind her, and and I thought, oh, that'll be a juvenile white-tailed sea eagle from 
from Scandinavia somewhere, probably. It turns out she says it's actually a bald eagle. So that's kind of neat that Hannah has a bald eagle behind her and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can go and get one, right? You know, I have quite a few of them in the other room, my living room. Uh, I could go and bring a bald eagle and sit in here, maybe uh, behind me. But uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm, thank, thanks, David. I'm going to throw in a few questions here, quite yeah, interesting ones. Chelsea Selter says, in Iceland, it, in Iceland, it's the tourists that are eating the whale meat. Is that the same in Norway? And that's just the one question. And then the other one from Phyllis is also an interesting question. Thank you for just keep on sending your questions, please. I'll do my best uh, to not overlook them. Phyllis says, are orcas more intelligent than other types of whales? So two very interesting questions. Hannah, please. <laughs> Well, the first question about uh, if is it tourists who are eating whale meat in Norway, I'm sure that there are a few tourists who are doing it just because they think, wow, we need to try this. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, it's local people who eat it. And as I said before, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a trend that's descending, that it's, uh, you don't see it very often in shops anymore. So I... I think it's it's vanishing. Uh, uh, the next question was about um, the intelligence. If, really, are orcas more intelligent than other, other whales? For saying killer whales, it's part partly something I do out of habit. I know that some people think they should be called be called orcas, and I'll happily call them orcas if only I remember to. Um, uh, are they more intelligent than other? Whales or animals, or what was the question? Yeah, probably whales first, and then in general, maybe if you if that's possible, if that's at all possible to answer. I well, don't know. You know, we can't even measure intelligence correctly in our own species. So to say exactly how right. much more intelligent they are than other species, I I won't be able to. I can't say that. Well, I can say that it's um, it's an animal that has a very strong social system uh, and very um, a lot of interesting social behavior uh, and therefore they have they exhibit they do a lot of learning uh, they have they even have what we call cultures which is a way of doing a certain set of behaviors that you'll find in some groups of animals, but not necessarily in the next group of animals, even if it's the same species. That's what we call cultures. And killer whales have cultures. They have cultures around how they hunt. Those killer whales in Norway that hunt herring, they don't switch to taking seals or taking salmon. They are specialized in that special hunting technique. They have different uh, they have their whole dialects where different groups have a distinct repertoire of sounds. Uh, right. and, and they have a lot of social behaviors that we recognize from our own species. Like they take care of their young, mm -hmm. they even sometimes take care of them even after they are dead. There was an incident in, in the, the Pacific Northwest two years ago where yeah female carried around a, a stillborn baby or, or a baby that died right after birth for 17 days. Is that grief? Well, we don't know. But every time we recognize something in a species, uh, which is not our own, but we recognize the behaviors, we take it as a sign of intelligence, and maybe it is. But, but I think my, question, my answer to the question is that it's, it's really hard to define intelligence and we can't measure it in an animal that lives in the sea but they are certainly uh, they are smart they collaborate uh, they learn a lot they probably learn all through their lives so yes they are intelligent but I, I can't put them on a scale so how old do orcas get <laughs> well to the best of our knowledge uh, females get 80 Mm -hmm. 90 years old, the oldest ones, and males maybe around 40, 50 years old. Oh. And this is a pattern which is uh, something that we see in many, many different species that females 
are older, but of course it's really interesting that um, killer whale females stop reproducing at some point. They go through menopause just like uh, is that humans. Right? Yeah, right. it is. And, and they still carry on. They live maybe 30 years after their last calf was born. And it's, uh, it's a way of, um, uh, they, they fill out a role as grandmothers and matriarchs in the society where they still contribute to the well-being and, f and general fitness of the, their family by just being alive. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I, that is very, very interesting. I, I love where Hannah is going with this because it, it goes back to remembering Jane Goodall kind of breaking the ice and talking about mm -hmm. the attributes of human beings and relating them to her chimps. And she did this for the first time and, and under great criticism. But so many of the animals do the same things as we do and and it's very difficult it, when we have an english language or a danish or a norwegian language to not use the familial words and she managed to change the the scientists to, to recognizing uh, that we can use a lot of these same terms and in, in in meaningful ways to describe the the behavior of, of these wild animals as the same things that we just define and, and so i it's getting down to this this area of intelligence and i agree with her god we can't define it in people so how are we going to mm -hmm. do relative differences between animal species but there's this other level this culture this this level of of in, intuitive involvement that people have that animals obviously have and it gets down to a couple of things. I mean, I, I've always uh, supported the concept of conservation. As I was growing up as a young kid, the word conservation came into being and it was defined as wise use of the resource, not no use, wise use. That might in rare cases be no use, but conservation meant wise use of the resource. And, and so many of the things that we we do uh, depend upon how we develop the uh, and and define the word wisdom and one of the the key elements has got to be this understanding of uh, these the abilities of animals to, to show biological diversity i mean all creatures need to keep supporting each other we don't live independently we live dependent upon each other and so we're dependent upon everybody at the same time and, and so it gets down well okay that that justifies hunting but yet with some species and this is where i find this whole thing where she's going about this cultural component you get to an animal that has so ingrained culture not not greatly different than ours i mean in 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 detail and, and then you have to pose the question is it valid is it valid to go out and kill these animals mm -hmm. i mean the native bands locally have got some kind of right to still go out and, and presumably using older technology spear and kill the some of the local whales now some of those local whales of course are gray whales these are the ones that have uh, spent since the 64 66 1964 and so on 66 being studied intimately in in scammons lagoon and so on down the the, the baja california coast these are animals that grew up through several generations <laughs> beside boatloads of people and they send often spend time of their every day with their heads resting against the uh, the, the side of a rubber boat looking into the eye of, of the scientist and so when those animals come up here and they come up alongside a boat and i have been up here when they came and laid their head on the side of a big rubber boat right here 
and I, I mean it's an awesome experience and to think that now we're going to tolerate that animal having a spear thrust in it jesus murphy uh, those are hard those are hard uh, decisions to come to I, I i find that a really a really difficult way of evaluating conservation yes there's something more than that Yes. Okay. I'm going to thank you very much, David. That's. Um, I, I'd love to hear Hannah's. Hannah, do you want to come? Because... I've got about four questions in queue here, at least. So okay. go ahead. Okay. Yes, fire. Okay, I'll go. This is an interesting question here from Arlene on Facebook. Uh, I'll just read this out. It's more a statement, but an interesting one. Are you aware of the orca populations of the coasts of Newfoundland and Labrador? They eat fish, seabirds, and smaller whale species such as mink whales. Uh, we call them generalists. They do have similar pod structures to the Norwegian and Icelandic orcas. Any comment on that? I, <laughs> that's quite detailed. Yeah, I, I know that they are there. Uh, and I, I actually didn't know that they were so generalist. Uh, but it's, it is discussed, too, with some of the group that we see uh, between Norway and Iceland because the uh, samples, um, biopsy samples, and, and where you can make fatty acid analysis actually indicate that they are more generalist than we may think they are. So uh, yes, it's, um, there might be some which can switch between different things. And I didn't know the ones in, in Newfoundland, Newfoundland did it. But, um, but we suspect that some of the Norwegian slash Icelandic ones are also generalists. Very good. Terry Green, uh, no, before that, sorry, Tiger Lady 999 asks, do orcas mate for life like eagles and penguins? Hmm. Probably not. Um, very few um, mammals actually do that. Most mammals are not monogamous. Uh, and if you look at for orca, there is a lot of indications that they are that there will be some hierarchies and fighting for access to females and where we see that is that there's a big sexual difference between them and also that the males have what we call secondary sex characteristics which of course is the tall fin which is twice as big as you see in females but also the pectoral fins are maybe four times bigger or three wow. times bigger than in females uh, and generally the males are bigger when you have those differences between males and females, mm -hmm. you suspect um, a breeding uh, system where there's um, competition for access to females and not monogamy. Interesting. Very, very interesting answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Here's a uh, question here from Terry Green. It's, of course, quite, quite a relevant question here. How has climate change affected their habitat, if any? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It has affected it mainly so far uh, in Norway and the Northeast Atlantic by bringing in a lot of mackerel. Uh, so mackerel is moving further north um, and herring is uh, present more or less as it has been before. But mm -hmm. with the mackerel, uh, comes also pilot whales. So ma pilot whales are also moving moving further north, uh, following the mackerel. Uh, uh, killer whales are also happy to eat mackerel. Uh, and we don't know what the dynamics is between pilot whales and killer whales. And in fact, I think it's a really interesting uh, field to look into. Uh, sometimes when we see them in the same area, we get a very strong feeling that it's the, the pilot whales that are aggressive and are chasing away killer whales. We've sometimes seen killer whales being chased out of the fjord with pilot whales coming after them. Uh, and we don't know if they're competing for food, or but, but killer, uh, pilot whales seem to be more aggressive. Um, oh. But so that could be something that could rock the boat uh, a bit that the pilot whales come in and the mackerels are moving in. The mackerels are moving further north. You have mackerel fisheries now uh, further between at, at the, the Faroe Island, the Iceland and around Greenland. So it's pushing, it's pushing that thing further up. 
And of course, if you go to the poles, um, you have killer whales that have specialized in hunting uh, belugas and narwhals and seals. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how they are affected. Nobody, as far as I know, have, have gone in and tried to study this in detail, but it, it, it will affect them. Well, that's, that's very interesting, of course. I mean, that's the direct question then related to fishing, of course. But let me first say, uh, here's a comment quickly from Amanda here on, on, on um, YouTube, says J1, that's referring to, of course, the, uh, the orcas here, named Granny and J-Pod, was one of the oldest North American killer, uh, uh, killer whales who was last seen in 2015. What is the oldest in the Norwegian population? Um... <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are individuals that we have photo ID'd around 1990, which have been recited mm -hmm. recently in 1718. So that makes them at least 30, between 30 and 40. If they were adult when we took pictures of them and they are still there, that means that they are plus 30 years old. But we haven't followed them for as long time as they've been followed in the Pacific Northwest. And there are maybe between, there's, there are more than 1,500 whales photo ID. So it's, it's a completely different picture and it's not, uh, we, we don't know them as detailed as you do in the Pacific Northwest. But there are individuals that we know are more than 30, 40 years. Do we, do we have an idea actually of the total population of killer whales in the whole world? Is there an estimate of that? No, and I, I think by far the biggest population is probably around Antarctica. Oh, right. And my so. guess is that there are several hundred thousand. Oh, several hundred thousand. Wow, yeah, that's... Where, more, where maybe half of them are around Antarctica. Oh, wow. Okay. Or, or a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not uh, facing extinction. At least I know that the local population in the southern residents are having a really, really um, hard time. But globally, killer whales are doing relatively well. David, do you want to add something on the Pacific Northwest because I mean, you've mentioned the subject? Well, Hannah is, is, is kind of right on that about the Pacific Northwest. One, there's this two basic feeding structures, one, one that feeds on fish and one that feeds on mammals. The mammal feeders are doing, it appears, quite well. Uh, in, in recent years, um, some of the whales, the, the big whales, are coming back again. So that's making that food source a bit more plentiful. And also, um, as the waters have warmed up and, and as we've gone out of this constant killing of everything we encounter, the the stellar sea lions have, have started to come back in many areas. And one of the other things that we now have here in, in southern British Columbia are California sea lions, and, and yet I did a, a paper in 1967 on California sea lions in British Columbia, and that was the first record of them in 1967, I think it was. So uh, now we have thousands of them. So that's a food source that the, the uh, transient orcas, the, the ones that kill mammals, um, their food source has actually increased. And, and so the orcas, the transient orcas, the mammal killing orcas, have also done relatively well. The big challenge locally is, is the orca that specialized in, in living for a big part of their life uh, on spring salmon or the, the big salmon, the ones that are 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds. Uh, those salmon have been just over harvested and relentlessly so and have not come back. And so the orcas that are feeding on them, and they're the most famous because they're the ones that live in, in Puget Sound, in, in the Salish Sea. It's known as the JKL pods. And I know way back in, in, in the 50s when I did some of my first aerial surveys of waterfowl, and I encountered what we thought was 295 orcas off Discovery Island. 
um, off of Victoria. And that was one of the first kind of guesstimates. Well, now we're down to in the 70s, maybe 78, 79, 80, depending on who's looking at them and when. I mean, the population has been decimated and this is the jkl pods that, that live on the salmon so different orcas like hannah's saying her orcas are doing relatively well because the food source the herring has done well and and of course off antarctica uh, the the krill base for a lot of things is doing very well still underneath the ice because it hasn't really changed for 50,000 years or more perhaps. So, so the krill base there is, is, is still supporting the whole food chain. Um, and, and it does so right up through to the, to the orcas. So they've done very well. And also some of the seals, the crab eater seals and the Weddell seal, they're in the millions down there. So that's another food source f for the Antarctic orcas. Right. So they've done, they're holding very well. The challenge for orcas has been in some of the northern areas where people are more aggressive as well. And that's the Japanese and, and, and so on. Here, orcas and all whales and all fish have fitted so incredibly into their method of sustaining their human population that if you take out the fish in big numbers you naturally reduce the orcas and if you're taking out also the whales as they have tend to done historically that also affects the other side of the whales the mammal eating whales so it, it gets down to this respect that people have for, for the different ecosystems and how we want to over harvest everything we need more herring and more more whales more more salmon we we haven't got into understanding the balance and uh, allowing all the ecosystems to to again flourish we still over harvest specific elements of it right. and th th that's devastating on a for, for the predators as well as for the the cod or the herring or the salmon. Right. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just uh, let me just go on Facebook quickly. This is Arlene again. Just an uh, interesting comment once again. Almost 50% of the humpbacks we see in the Western North Atlantic have bite marks on their flukes or rake marks on dorsal fins. Uh, are you seeing any evidence of this in your humpback population? If Norwegian orcas oh. feed mainly on herring, probably yeah, pr probably not common. Great question. Uh, <laughs> I found you something really interesting about uh -huh. humpbacks and killer whales in right. Norway. Because mm -hmm. when I started studying killer whales in Norway many years ago, 30 years ago, uh, it was just killer whales. We never saw humpback whales. And in the summertime, we saw sperm whales. Uh, offshore, sometimes the minke whale, few times we saw pilot whales, but we never saw, saw humpbacks. But the humpbacks, as you probably know, has made a recovery which is exceptional. Mm -hmm. uh, so humpbacks have started coming to the Norwegian coast uh, in numbers which are incredible. Uh, so in, in 2010, wow. there's been some years where the herring was offshore in the wintertime and we, we didn't see the killer whales. And then when they started, herring started to come back to the coastal areas in the winter in 2010. That was the first year that humpbacks also came to feed on herring. So we had humpbacks and killer whales in the same area feeding on the same thing. And the interesting thing is that the humpbacks, they just move in. They, they behave like a motorcycle gang. They just move in shoulder by shoulder. They are giants and they don't care at all about killer whales. And the killer whales are dwarfed compared to the humpbacks. And they keep in the periphery. And the really interesting thing, you know, I talked about how the killer whales work and work and work to get this ball of herring so that they can finally start feeding on it. When they start feeding, 
it takes sometimes only minutes before the humpbacks arrive. I suspect that they can hear now there's a feeding going on and then they move in and then they almost parasitize on all the work that the killer whales have right? done keeping the herring together. And they just shoot up from the bottom with their mouths open like this and then they take the whole thing. Uh, and, and killer whales are left in the periphery and they can get whatever fish they can catch there. But yes, we do see rake, rake marks on, on flukes every now and then, but it's my absolute uh, impression that a healthy uh, adult humpback whale really don't care about killer whales. Isn't that interesting? I'm just, I saw that question also before. Is there any videos on this? On, uh, uh, do you know of any footage that, yeah, you know? Yeah, lots of videos. Lots, okay, well, I'll look, I'll look into that. Maybe I can find it and, and, and show that. Yeah, I mean, I've been on several expeditions where we have filmed it. Wow, fantastic, F fantastic. And okay, more, so many more questions. I'm sorry, but there are so, so many interesting questions. Uh, I'm first going to stick still to Facebook, then we jump to the other side again. Uh, gosh, where was I? Yes. Let me let me ask. Uh, let me tell uh, Hannah a story that got me motivated because it's it's relative, n not to her orca behavior, but the human attitude behaviors. Um, Hannah, when I w was fifteen, I was learning to fly, and it be I I much more enjoyed putting my hours in to build up to get toward the license by flying along the shoreline and looking into the trees to count and find the eagle nest. And, and I did this up and down the B, BC coast, and then I would fly over on the American coast. And I, and I kind of mentioned it, but what, what I, I didn't get to say was, by the time I had finished getting my license, I realized that British Columbia, every island was lined with bald eagle nests and not one pair of eagles nested on the Washington coast. And so when I became 16 and got my license, my father gave me his car and I went over and I saw that those buckets on, on the bottom of those trees. And I told you uh, on the bottom of the boats where the, the fishermen would shoot these eagles. And I, I, I told you this, but what I really wanted to say was it made me realize this distinction between a bounty Mm -hmm. People offering two dollars for a, a pair of, uh, of eagle legs versus in Washington State. Well, it was it paid for in Alaska, but it was the Washington resident fishermen who went to Alaska to, to spend their summers, and and so they they shot the eagles in in Washington. We didn't do that, and so there was there's a huge incentive here, and and I and I think that that that's important to build into this philosophy of, of, of how humans respond to things. When the incentive is there, we can even often add more justification. Either it, it's government acknowledgement of a need and a, and a desire, so that gives people an excuse to kill, but it also puts money in their pocket. So it's an incentive to do it from a second point of view. So I, I I have a feeling this plays a role across our attitude toward predators because we shot seals here. We paid five dollars a nose for seals for a great many years. And I know it's debated right now, right now, that they do the same thing again with some of the sea lions. And, and it will have a huge effect and change the attitude of people again toward predators. I mean, because if you if you're killing one predator, you want to tend to kill them all, and and it's philosophically going to be a, I think, a big lead, a big a big change of direction um, if we start to pay people to kill them again. Uh, Awkward. Where do you set on something like this, Hannah? It's it's a really difficult philosophical uh, question to answer. I think it's I think it's uh, it's a terrible thing to do because we we need the wildlife. 
I understand that there are conflicts sometimes with fisheries and that we need to to address these conflicts uh, because if you're a fisherman you can you you it is an obvious problem but it's we can't just eradicate the wildlife that we think is in our way uh, because we need it we need the wildlife right and another thing is that we we change the behavior of the wildlife if we start shooting them i think that there's there's so much uh pleasure to be had from being surrounded by wildlife maybe now more than ever i mean the whole world is now in a situation now where we are we are uh, deprived of so many things because you can't go into the restaurants you can't go to uh, cinemas there are lots of things you can do but nature is right outside and at least those countries where you are still allowed to walk outside it's where we can find a peace of mind and uh, meeting wild animals at least for me has always been probably the greatest pleasure in my life and i think the minute we start shooting them they will avoid us and and it will never be the same again right. that's another thing that we need to think about is that when you don't shoot them for it, it takes it takes depending on the species 10 15 50 years before you can again get close to wildlife if you want yes. shot them yes. and i know a, i know david I, was I telling similar stories experiences in nature we need to take care of it okay now we got so i mean this is so fascinating we've got a lot of questions lined up so i'm going to try <laughs> and get through them because it's the queue's getting big which is great actually so first of uh, sheree finally i get to your questions do they migrate or are they territorial maybe uh, that, that that's a good question so uh, hannah please i don't think they're territorial uh, and they certainly migrate Mm -hmm. because uh, at least the whales that i know they follow the herring so they will they will simply follow them and they can travel huge distances we have uh, tried satellite tagging some whales uh, once and it turned out that the majority of the whales that we had tagged uh, they followed the herring south uh, when the herring started moving south along the norwegian coast two whales went straight north more than a thousand kilometers straight north i mean we don't know what they were going for uh, but they certainly had a different agenda yes they can travel very very big distances um and they do that great and here, here comes some good questions here tiger lily is saying for how many centuries have orcas been on earth so this is more the evolutionary question we'll get to darwin anyway that's a good, good point and um uh, how did the last global warming affect them if one knows that at all so what do we know about the history or evolution of orcas well i don't know very much about it i mean the whales started to diversify uh, more than 30 between 30 40 million years ago uh, they started to we started to have the first whales and they didn't look like modern whales um and then at some point i think maybe 20 million years ago we started to have both baleen whales and tooth whales uh, before that they were only tooth whales so the baleens is a later adaptation uh, and killer whales as we know them i think are maybe 500,000 years uh, old as species or maybe a little bit more yeah and the, I have no idea okay. how they did under the last uh, climate change i don't even know what is meant with the last climate change um was it before the ice age uh, i'm not really sure okay okay Okay, uh, next question. What type of, mar this is Terry Green asking, what type of markers do you use to identify them? How do you know? <laughs> well, we, we use the same as is used uh, in other studies of killer whales around the world. Uh, we use photo identification, which means that we look at their fins and the dorsal pattern, the gray 
saddle area behind the dorsal fin, which we usually have scars and nicks and stripes. And sometimes also the oval white eye patch. Um, and those things combined is usually enough to make a good identification if the picture is sharp. Um, and there's a French uh, woman, her name is Yves Jourdain, and she, she works on the ID catalog for Norwegian killer whales. And I think she has identified more than 1,500 whales now. Wow, okay, that's amazing. Christina is asking on, on Facebook, are there volunteer organizations that collect observational data of orcas globally? How can people who are passionate about orcas and conservation become involved in research? I visited orcas in Tromsø, uh, San Juan, and would love to uh, love to be more help in a meaningful way. That's quite a statement there, yes. Yeah, uh, to my knowledge, there's mm. not a, a, like a global organization mm. that you can just mm. walk into, but there are obviously there are different projects in different parts of the world. Uh, and in some places of the world, there are many different projects. Uh, and, um, and some of them probably take volunteers. Uh, usually to become a volunteer is not something that you just do. Uh, you 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 have to write and tell you about yourself uh, mm -hmm. if they look for volunteers and tell what qualifications you have and and um, it's usually a longer process. Very good. Okay, and then let, then, me, then... Introduce, let me introduce another slightly different topic. Um, many years ago, well, back in about two thousand and five and two thousand and six, Hannah, we introduced. Um, wildlife cameras into eagle nests that hadn't been done and been made popular well i instantly then proposed and i've been talking about it kind of since then quietly that that was such a mm -hmm. an elucidation of, of information we we gained such an insight into eagle behavior by having those cameras in the nest For, uh, first off you, you saw things differently than you'd ever seen before by looking up telescope you realize all of a sudden they have a, a, a whole life at night as well because they're interacting with horned owls and raccoons and but i proposed at the time that we set up uh, a dozen cameras um out on the different points in, in the salish sea here and possibly also uh, more lately i've been trying to advocate that we also put cameras on the tour boats and some people say, oh, that'll give more publicity. Well, precisely, it'll give more publicity. People first thought when we put cameras in eagles' nests that, oh, it would give away where eagle nests were. Well, I mean, people don't give a darn. The first nest that we put had cameras in, that person never had a single soul come to his his nest until after three years, he invited a pair of Germans a couple from Germany to come out and stay with him and look at it because they've been communicating. That's the only people he ever had come to his eagle nest. Now, of course, we have hundreds and hundreds of nests that the public know about locally, and we've got four or five nests every year with cameras in them. And nobody has ever been bothered by, uh, the eagles have never been bothered to my knowledge ab about the, having their nests on camera. I don't think it would do anything but give good incredible educational and um, awareness about the eagles. If we got cameras on the different points and in the boats, it, it wouldn't, it would stop instantly people harassing them with boats because there would be a written record for the court. It would be on file, on film. And, and so people just couldn't get away with things at all bad. And I think it would make the world aware of particularly this JKL pods where I can see it being meaningful for helping with their recovery. What, what is your thought? Do you, do you have people putting cameras on points of land and so on um, in, in the Norwegian area as, as possible? No, not, pioneered here? not yet, but I won't uh, exclude that it could happen. They, they, it's a very vast area they are in. So my guess is that you would have a lot of days with no many, many, many days with no sightings. And then one day they are there. Uh, and then they have also the last 10 years, they have 
moved a lot so that if it was if it was in the Anfjord one year, it was maybe 200 kilometers to the north of that the next year. So they're not so stationary that it, I would say that it really makes sense doing it. Um, but uh, I think putting out hydrophone cables and, and, and following them acoustically may be more, give more sense because you can hear them actually further away than you can see them. Yeah, well, I agree about, about the sound because that's what was pioneered here with the spongs, uh, Helena in particular, go, going way back into the in, in, into the into the 80s. Um, but we have this situation in, in the Salish Sea where, where the where the orcas are really following the salmon populations, or they're the transients are coming to places where there's known seal haulouts. Um, both of which are, are pretty reliable. I mean, they're not at each place all day long, but they're pretty regularly at, at the several sites. It's almost as though you could count, if you had a dozen camera points, you could almost count on one of them covering seals during the summer. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I quite like that in Norway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me see. I've got so many questions again. Uh, let me just jump in here quickly. One second. Oh, yes, Amanda has, has a question here. Uh, actually, for David, mysterious orcas beaching deaths caused by the Navy and their depth charges, causing them great mental distress, damaging their hearing and navigation. Is this still happening? Maybe that's to both of you. Do you know about this? Yeah, I know about this. And, and I think there's enough documentation now that uh, some naval sonars are actually damaging uh, whale ears and causing stranding. So that's potentially really bad. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, I've not done direct research on it, but I've read a number of, of studies that imply this implicitly. I mean, it's very difficult to, to, to detect it. In, in something else, but um, there's now a, a lot of records of animals with damaged parts of their hearing and brain. So I think it's pretty, pretty evident. Um, an animal is so dependent upon sound to have this incredible racket underwater. How, how can it not? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's logical. There's some things that are so fundamentally logical, you can't just deny them, even though we... Uh, have had difficulty pinning down some of the science. It doesn't mean it isn't there waiting to be understood. Right. A quick here point from Sonia that's quite interesting. I'm sure that you both had memorable experiences with, with killer whales. Is there one experience that quickly comes to your mind that made an impact on your studies or you personally? Uh, Hannah, that's really for you then. <laughs> yes, there is. And, and I'm actually starting this, the book I'm writing now about killer whales, I'm starting with that experience because I was on this boat where I worked as the cook and it was the first season. And um, I didn't get out as much as the other people because I was cooking. Mm -hmm. So at the time where most of them had great stories to tell over the dinner table, I still hadn't seen them. And then this guy came back one day because he had forgotten something and, and said, we have killer whales just around the corner and if I wanted to come along. So I jumped into a lot of clothes and brought my camera and into the Zodiac and off we went. And it was very windy when we got out. So we had to go slowly, which was incredibly frustrating because I really wanted to see these whales. And we came out of the harbor and there was this huge towering mountain and it was completely covered in clouds. And it was very gray and slight rain. So we came around the corner below this big mountain, and this was where the whales were. And there was, of course, nothing. There was, there was just a few seagulls. And we sat there for a long time, just looking and looking and looking. And then, and then this uh, this guy he he brought out a hydrophone, and he uh, he gave me the headphones, and then he lowered the hydrophone into the water, oh. and. I heard the whales and I knew immediately what it was. And it was eerie and beautiful 
and melodious at the same time. I could hear them crawling through the ocean. I could also hear distant fishing boats, uh, but I could hear the whales calling. I couldn't see them. They were nowhere to be seen. And that experience was, in many ways, it was the turning point in my life because it was incredibly beautiful and mysterious and interesting at the same time. Uh, and we never saw them that day. Uh, we find they got more and more faint and dis finally the disappeared and we gave up and didn't see them. But I didn't need to see them. I knew they were there and they were commun communicating and it was just amazing. Well, that's that's a beautiful way, uh, you know. That that's amazing. That's an answer I certainly didn't expect. And thanks, Sonia, for asking that question. It's a very good question. Uh, what I would like to finally do is uh, just focus a bit, Hannah, on 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 the book that you wrote on the called the Modest. Oops, sorry, that there we go. A Modest Genius. Well, I should. Uh, I mean, Amazon. Here, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> that gave me to the Amazon link. Let me just go back again here. Um, so I started reading this, uh, the, the Kindle edition, so the online edition, and it's absolutely beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about the book and maybe if you have time just to read us one or two paragraphs from your book and, and how you got into this? Thank you. Oh, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> I wrote the book uh, because I, I was really interested in Darwin. I still am. I think he's in, I mean, when people ask you what person if you could pick, would you most like to sit next to at a dinner table? And my and what historic person? And my choice would always be Darwin. Mm -hmm. He's the one that I really want to sit next to and have a conversation with. There's so many things I want to ask him. I think he's a fascinating and interesting person. And I, I, I went actually to the local library to see if I could get some books. And there was very little. And then I found some in, in, a, in an English bookshop, but I, most of them were very, very scholarly. They were either a biography, which was so heavy here, very big, heavy biography and very scholarly, or they were biology textbooks. There was nothing that really told the story of Darwin. So, so I, that's the one I tried to write, um, the story of Darwin's life but also of his discovery. What exactly was it that he found out? So that's the, um, yeah, that's the, this is what it looks like. Yes. A modest genius, because that's what he was. And you asked me to read a little bit. Yes, message. please, please do. Yes. <laughs> For those who tend to think of Darwin as a sober old man with a long white beard, here's an opportunity to con conjure up a different image. The, the, the young Charles Darwin was more of a 19th century Indiana Jones. Tall, slim, athletic, always ready to climb a mountain or trek on horseback day after day. He happily hunted and shot his own game for dinner, cooked it on a campfire and then slept out under the stars. He rode home with satisfaction. I am become quite a gaucho drink my mate and smoke my cigar and then lie down and sleep as comfortably with the heavens for a canopy as in a feather bed. Uh, this was when he was very young. Um, can I, um, Christian, can I, let me ask her of course, a question. Go ahead. I have watched sure. her. I have the same fascination with him, but I've never written a book about him. But I've, I've seen so many films over the years, and everybody focuses uh, on the Finches and and on the the evolution that took place on these small islands, where it's very, very, very uh, obvious. But I've often felt, and I want to ask Hannah if she accepts the same premise that the really defining part of his life was his first year that he spent largely in Argentina and South America, where he spent all that time digging up the bones of dinosaurs. And if, if there was anything that ever gave anybody in, in his age class a first inkling, a, a positive inkling, that, that creatures 
had to have lived one hell of a long time. It was digging up the bones of dinosaurs, and he perhaps dug up more than than anybody in his era. And so I, it's always been seemed more important to me that his whole theme of evolution was set by those early years. He managed to get. I, I, yeah. I actually completely with, agree with you, but I have to correct you at the same time because it wasn't dinosaurs he, he dug up. It was actually, it was semi-fossilized bones of uh, the relatives of modern sloths and modern armadillos. Yes, I, I, you're correct. Giant, yeah. giant armadillos and it was giant sloths. And those were the bones that he dug up. And I completely agree that it was a defining moment for him to find it. It was so defining that his first sentence in the origin of species is actually about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but my book is about that it's not just that. It's actually like a big puzzle where he picks up pieces on the way. And the f very first piece he, he digs up is actually reading a book by Charles Lyell that yes, tells him that the yeah. landscapes have been transformed mm -hmm. by wind and weather and volcanoes and earthquakes. And all it takes for landscapes to transform completely for a mountain range to rise from the seabed to the mountaintop is time small changes and a lot of time. And that principle he brought into biology. Yes. So that was the first clue that he picked up on the way. And the next clue is the giant bones from armadillos and sloths in South America that taught him that extinct animals have relatives in the same ge geographical areas which are modern. Uh, modern sloths and modern armadillos in South America, and he picked he 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 picked up that clue, and he picked up different clues along the way. So for me, the way I see it is that he picked up big pieces to a puzzle, and finally, when he got home, he was able to put this whole puzzle together. But another really important part of the puzzle was a book he read after he got home which was the book that was Principles of Population, about how populations have a tendency to grow and grow and grow and explode, now, unless unless they're cut down all the time by diseases and competition. And he, this book was talking about human populations, but Darwin realized, oh, this is true for all wild animals and plants, that unless disease and warfare and space and are limiting they they are limiting factors unless they are there everybody they, they there would be elephants everywhere or oak trees or whatever species but they're all kept in charge because they're competing and so he he, he this this was like a big puzzle that he put together that's the one the book is about at the same time as it's telling the really lovely story about Darwin's own life, mm. his family, and how he was coping uh, after he got back from from the trip with the beetle. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm I'm looking forward to reading it as well. I haven't got to it yet, but I will. Yeah, I was I was absolutely intrigued, and then of course it dawned on me that this, um, Lyle, what his name was, the geologist, where he understood that that changes come in very slow and not abruptly, like uh, was assumed by 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 many others, made such an influence on. But to 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 make that mental bridge takes a lot of genius. I mean, it does. It's uh, it sounds so easy, but to make that step in your mind takes a lot you know it's just incredible <laughs> so. well what he really had to overcome was not just the step in his mind just, but it was the yeah, but, cultural surrounding yeah, I mean, he was brought up as, a, as a, to be a minister yeah, yeah. that's his that's correct yes, yes hung yes. on to all these concepts to the, yes. oh, i guess right to the bitter end or near i don't remember the detail yeah, uh, then, um, uh, he was actually his his father was a doctor <laughs> and wanted both his sons to be doctors. And and Darwin dropped out of school, so to say, 
And so the idea that he could become minister was like the second choice. And, and, and I actually think the father was disappointed in him. That's, uh, right. so that's, that's uh, what they settled on. Then he could become a minister. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's probably the, the what delayed him writing this book for so long. He didn't just come home and kind of put it together. It took many years to mm. to assemble uh, the the actual detail of the argument because he had to make sure that not only was he convinced, but that the world would be convinced because he was well, going out on such a big limb. Totally true. He knew he knew what he was sitting on. He knew it was a paradigm shift. He knew it was incredible. He was totally aware of that. Uh, and therefore, he actually also wrote a letter to his, his, uh, his wife very early in 42, uh, which was uh, seven, 15 years before uh, the Origin Species uh, was published. He wrote a letter to his wife with the whole idea lined out and told her, if I die, this has to be published. And then he sat down and worked out every single argument line by line because he knew it would take a lot to convince the, his contemporary society about it. Wow. Well, I, I, I thought it was remarkable. I mean, only reading the first two chapters, but, uh, you know, when he went on this famous exhibition uh, expedition about the, the beagle, how small it was. I always thought these boats were gigantic. It turns out it's about, you wrote 100 feet, that's 30 meters. That's tiny. And then he had to have this small cabin which he had to share with others and he was lying in a havoc. And I thought, how on earth did he organize all the, the, the collection of all the samples that he was doing? It must have taken incredible discipline. He hardly had any space to even write or so. You know, that, I, that's think he, I think he was very disciplined. And he also <laughs> said in his life that the discipline he learned while on Beagle <laughs> stayed with him for the rest of his life. So he was a very organized yes. person the rest of his life because of having because of forced to be so on Beagle. Yes, and then of course you know he had to, he was a he was there to entertain the captain, but at the same time the captain turns out was very opposed to his ideas and became I think quite ferocious afterwards. Is that correct? I think. Yeah, afterwards, yeah. but actually yeah. they got along quite yeah, well. Yeah, right. Couple of years, they were incredibly happy together. They went on mm -hmm. long trips together, but I think the friendship soured a bit uh, during the voyage, and later they they didn't get along. Well, that's fascinating. Well, well, thank you. I think, you know, we've uh, spent incredible, almost one and a half hours here. <laughs> that's absolutely incredible. And, and, and then also, David, thank you so much for, for, for jumping in, both of you, just really making it so interesting. We had lots of uh, wonderful comments here and, and, and people who really enjoyed this, found this highly educational. So I'm, I'm really grateful we could do this. So I think uh, let's uh, end this and uh, end it on a you know really positive uh, note to look more at nature and enjoy nature. I mean, I don't know if I've, you know you were talking Hannah about the uh, uh, you know us all being quarantined now and we look out and see how nature is recovering. Well, it's not all recovering in a short time, but we do see a lot of changes. You know, in in in, in many polluted areas, it's just amazing. That's what I'm watching watching out for a lot so you know hopefully this also gives us a gives us a little bit more time to reflect about what wildlife really means to us and that we are very dependent on it i know that's what david always says but i'm just putting it into another context here <laughs> okay well 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 thanks yeah great pleasure hmm. sorry it's oh it's a pleasure I'm just saying it's been a great pleasure. yeah david do you want a famous last words <laughs> oh he's gone I thought David's too quiet. I think we lost him. <laughs> we may have, he thought he's too quiet. <laughs> so I think we may have just, just lost him. It's okay. Uh, you know, fortunately, we got um, most of it. So anyway, I'm, so I'm first going to say, um, I wish everyone, so I'll put, put uh, Henne there so everyone can see you properly. One second, I will blend myself out now. And also David, 
I just so for those of you who have uh, you, once again that was Hannes Streyer. I hope I say it correct. I'm probably completely wrong, but it doesn't matter. Zoologist and science writer. Thank you very much to talk to us about about uh, orcas, killer whales, and and also about Charles Darwin. And she's also um, busy with another book on orcas. So. I, th I think it's it's absolutely wonderful uh, to have had you. So first, I'll say goodbye to everyone here on uh, uh, on on YouTube.